Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 1 Peter this morning. 1 Peter. We're going to begin a new series. And I'm going to begin, the, the Lord willing, unless the Lord just completely interrupts me, we're going to begin preaching through the book of 1 Peter. Now we will pause uh, come Easter time for a Easter type message, but we will begin this first week of March in 1 Peter in chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse 1. Now we're having a little problem. If you're watching on our live stream, it was being a little slow for some reason. Not sure exactly why. The audio is still coming through clear. So hopefully that will work for you. If not, we're going to try to post service. We'll uh, fix that and be able to post that video for those that like to watch that. And that will be available. Uh, but for those of you that hear that doesn't uh, apply to you. But there are some that this morning I've already noticed we're watching Online, And we apologize about any issue we're having there. And hopefully we'll be able to get that straightened out. But I think the audio is still coming through clearly. If you would, stand with me. If you're physically able to stand, and we're going to read in 1 Peter, and beginning in verse 1. And we're going to take our time. As we read this... Uh, I want to break this up. We're going verse by verse, but I want to try to break this up into bite-sized pieces. And so that may mean, and again, I always caution when I say that maybe a shorter period of time preaching. It may not be. Sometimes I get carried away and uh, it won't be. But I want it's, getting into Peter is deeper than getting into the book of Mark, which was Peter's gospel. Um, it's a little bit deeper because Peter is deeper. He's made it through deeper waters spiritually in his growth, and so therefore his writing demonstrates that than where he was perhaps necessarily. And also, it was designed to be simpler in the Gospels because that's where oftentimes people began. But now in the, the, the letters, the epistles, and this was a epistle of Peter to the church, to the believers, um, there's some greater understanding, and he wants them to have some greater understanding. And so we're going to try to break it down into smaller, bite-sized pieces. I'm going to read seven verses. We probably will not touch on every aspect of that verse this morning, but I want you to read along with me as we acknowledge the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let's pray again. Father, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for these words of Peter as inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is your words. And God, I thank you that we can read about this encouraging letter, this encouraging words of Peter that was written to the early church in the first century. But Father, these words were also written to us. Let them be an encouragement. Let them be a reminder. Let them be a reason to celebrate this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to give you reasons for glory. Reasons for glory. 
You know, we live, and I, I say, let me back up for one second. I said reasons for glory. This morning, I'm only going to give you one reason, really, is we're going to touch on. There's three that I want you to see that these reasons of glory, but we're just going to get to one this morning. I try to make this more bite-sized pieces, but I want you to see that I realize, and I often talk about this, and maybe I talk about it too much, but because of the curse of sin, we are living in a world of hurt sorrow and pain because of the curse of sin the fall of man back in genesis chapter 3 we see or genesis chapter genesis chapter 2 we see 2 and 3 we see where adam and eve fell and therefore sin and the consequences of sin has been passed on to all mankind and the world is cursed because of sin and therefore we have hurts we have sorrows we have pains because of the curse of sin we are increasingly today bombarded with evil wickedness paganism worldliness there's an anti-Bible, anti-church, anti-Jesus, and anti-God ideology that permeates our society. And it's a wave of growing ideology that is trying to threaten the church. And it seems like we're losing. It seems like, listen, as Christians, we're dwindling in number, it seems like. In fact, if you read the statistics, as far as in Christendom, as far as just the religion, it's shrinking, not growing. As far as in the Baptist world, in the Southern Baptist world, our numbers are shrinking and not growing. And it can be so discouraging. We look around in our church, and I realize that part of this is because of COVID. I realize that part of this is because of age and all kinds of other things that we can say this is an excuse or this is a reason or this is that or whatever it might be. But I realize that ultimately it's because of the curse in which we live. But our world has become so upside down and backward and sideways in its thinking and living and even their protesting we live in a world of untold number of abortions daily taking place, being funded with our tax dollars. Uh, in case you didn't notice, that was what, what President Trump had put into place to stop our tax dollars from going overseas for abortions and to try to slow that spread of that money to places like Planned Parenthood and others. Now that's been reversed again. And now here we are once again funding the murder of innocent unborn children by untold numbers. And it's being celebrated and paraded. We live in a world that has a growing crisis at our borders. We live in a world with a mounting problem of people and children trafficking. We live in a world where unemployment is again on the rise and depression and mental disorders are increasing. Violence and murder rates are skyrocketing. Vi uh, homelessness is overtaking many cities. I was watching just the other day in California and they were driving down highways and into cities and the camps and the tents and the people just thronging. It's almost as if there's just thousands upon thousands of people that are in these situations. Veterans and military personnel being abandoned by the people that they have protected. And I say the world is looking at it and our nation is looking at it sideways and upside down and backwards because in case you didn't notice in the news this week, the focus has been on the gender identity of Mr. Potato Head and Mrs. Potato Head. And the focus of our attention in the world today has been on Dr. Seuss and the books that have been written. The world has gotten it so backwards. The world has gotten it so disjointed. The world has gotten it so wrong. And if we're not careful, and in fact, many times we can be overcome with this flood of negativity, this flood of of anti-godlessness or anti-God and godlessness, I should say. If we're not careful, we can become consumed with these realities and the responses to our world issues and real needs. Listen, we've got to focus our attention on things above, 
not on things of the earth. Otherwise, we will become, listen, it can be depressing. Listen, you take all those things I just talked about and you put it on top of all the rain that we had and all the COVID and all the still stay at home stuff and people isolating and quarantining and it can be crushing. I was just reading just the other day about how they did a study. This is a number of years ago, and it's no different today, probably worse today. But a number of uh, a study where they took children in two different, in two different uh, uh, homes, group homes. These were children who were orphans. And in both homes, they gave them all the physical things they needed. All the food, all the clothes, the toys, all the advantages that they could be given. And in one home, they also smothered them and covered them in affection, in personal interaction. And they found in this study that the children, in the other home they did not. They had all the things they could want, but they did not get the personal interaction and the affection and the love and the attention. And they found that the group that received the physical interaction, the children grew by two inches on average, taller than the ones who did not. They found that the children that received the attention, the affection, and the interaction were much healthier in their weight and even in their heating habits and even in their living habits. They found that in the home where they did not get the same amount of attention, disease and sickness and depression were rampant. Now, if that was the case with children, do you think it's not all the more the case with adults and seniors who sometimes can't get up? And listen, and now we've replaced personal interactions with cell phones and texting and all these kind of things and Facebook and social media. Listen, I'm not against social media. I'm not against texting, texting or technology. What I'm saying is this. We're limiting and eliminating some of the very things that we desperately need. And if we're not careful, we can become overwhelmed with all that is going on, all that we are dealing with, and the world has gotten it so backward. And if we're not careful, we find ourselves as Christians diving into the negativity, diving in to the depression, diving into the anger and the bitterness and the resentment, and we become defensive and vindictive. More and more I see and I hear Christians joining in a chorus of negativity, angst, and pessimism. And I want to remind you, Christian, I want to remind you, our response is to be different. Our response is to be different. Christian, I want to remind you that there is a reason to celebrate. Amidst all that I just talked about, you say, well, preacher, you're just making it worse. Listen, I say all that to contrast this. We have reason because of this passage, because of the Word of God, because of what God is doing, what God has done, and what He will do. We have reason to celebrate, to glory. And so, therefore, I want to give you these reasons in the next coming weeks for glory. No matter what is taking place, no matter what time it is, no matter what's going on in your life, it is time, past time, to glory. Both to glorify God and to glory in Christ. As I was reading this, just a way of further my introduction, I want you to understand that Peter is the one writing this letter. Now, if we think of Peter, we think of several things. Of course, we think of him as being the leader of the apostles. We think of him as having lived under the, uh, under the, the ministry of Christ. We think of him as being the one that often would open his mouth and often insert his foot. We think of him as being the one who walked on water. We think of him as the one who denied Christ three times. We think of him for positive and for negative. He was a person that had great successes with Christ. He was a person who often failed Christ. He was a person who had seen Christ crucified. He was a person who had seen Christ resurrected. He was a person who had been persecuted and pressured, imprisoned, threatened, and beaten. And we can't say, as bad as we have it today, that we have it worse than what Peter had. And yet his message in verses 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 is exactly what we need today. The verses, by the way, the recipients of his letter, the direct recipients were the early church, the Christians, the believers of that first century. Those Christians, those early believers, they also, listen, they also 
the, the, the true church, the true believers now, had been persecuted, pressured, imprisoned, beaten. They've been scattered. They were poor. They were struggling. They were outnumbered. They seemed like they were losing the battle. Not so very different from today. And we can't say, as bad as it might be with what we see in the news, as bad as what we might see with things in politics, as bad as the things that we see that's going on in the world today, it is no worse today than it was for them then. And yet the message that Peter had in his heart and the message that he was communicating to the believers of that day is the same message that God wants us to hear today. There is reason to celebrate. There is reason to glory. This message that he had given is a message of hope. It's a message of encouragement. It's a message of peace. It's a message for strength. It's a message to celebrate. And again, as I said, it's a message for us today. And so I want to give you this now. Number one reason that I've got today for reasons to glory is because you have been born to glory. You have been born to glory. I want you to see this. It says here, look down in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten or born us again unto a lively hope. We are born again to a lively hope. Listen, there's reason to celebrate because of the work of Christ, because of the mercy of God, because of the grace of God, because of the blessings of God, the sanctification in verse 2 of the Spirit, the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto us. Peace be multiplied. There is reason to celebrate. We were born again to a lively hope because of the work of Christ. We were born to glorify God. Now listen, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were born the first time, if you will, in a fleshly sense. We were birthed into this world, but we were born into sins, and therefore we really had no ability to celebrate and to worship and to glorify God. But He born us again because of the work of Christ. If you've trusted in God, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sin, if you've called on Him for salvation, you've been born again and for the purpose of glorifying God. God and giving Him glory. Not only that, but you are born to know the glory of God. But preacher, what, what do you mean the glory of God? I want you to understand when we say glory, sometimes we talk about glory as far as celebrating, but also glory to know all that He is. Glory, the glory of God is not one attribute or one characteristic or one act that He has done. It is all that He is. Everything that He is is glory. And all my friends, we are born to glorify Him because of that. And we're born to know Him and know just how worthy He is of our glory. But also we're born to be glorified by God. I'm telling you, there's reason to celebrate because in a world of negativity, in a world of hate and violence and crime, and in a world of depression and suicide, listen, there is reason to celebrate if you know Christ. Do you know Christ? Shake your head at me. Nod your head at me. Make sure you're still awake. Because y'all looking at me like I didn't give you any reason to celebrate. If you, are, if you know Christ and you're saved, there is a reason for joy. There is a reason to celebrate. There is a reason for somebody to say amen. amen. Thank you, Roger. I'm not normally a person that asks people to say amen, but I'm telling you what, if you don't get excited about the fact that, listen, I've got reason to jump up and down and celebrate, then you've got no business going to a Clemson game and jumping up and down and celebrating. If you can't celebrate over the fact that you were born again, born because of the grace and mercy of God, Oh, listen, I'm telling you, we're born to glorify Him and praise Him and celebrate Him. And we're born to be glorified by Him. And one day we'll be glorified with glorified bodies and we'll be in glory, sharing glory with Him. Because I want you to understand a little bit about the Christian's birth. Listen, there's reason to celebrate because if you're here today and you've been saved, you were chosen by God, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and 
sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and be grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You were elected. He said, Preacher, what does that mean? We can't understand all that, that means, but it's a fact that God in his love chose you or you would not be saved. Now, if you're saved, you were chosen. So don't get too caught up in all that election talk. I'm not here to dive into that this morning. What I'm here to say is this. If you're saved, you were elected. If you were elected, you're, you're, you, if you're saved, you're one of the elected. All right? So therefore, there's reason to celebrate because you don't have to look at the world the same. You don't have to look at death the same. You don't have to look at the circumstances and the end, the finish line, the same. There's reason for celebration because you're a Christian's birth. You were chosen by God back before the world began. And listen, so well, how do I get chosen? Well, it was nothing that you could do. It's nothing that you did do because you weren't there when he chose you. The reason it's the election, because the salvation is really all up to him. He's the one responsible for our salvation. He said, well, didn't I pray and accept? Yes, you did. If, if, if you've been saved, you did. But you also had to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. And you had to have Jesus Christ die on the cross. And God did those things. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. We weren't even on the scene when we were so elected. It's based wholly on His grace and His love for us. And oh, I'm telling you, it's reason to celebrate. We can't explain it. I can't explain it. I've yet to meet any kind of theologian or scholar that can sufficiently explain it. But I do know this. It's worth celebrating that God reached down for me. God reached down for you. I told you before, described it as this way, is God's grace is Him reaching down and our faith is us reaching up and grasping that hand and taking that hand by faith and believing that, listen, no matter what happens to me with COVID, no matter what happens to me in my car, no matter what happens to me in this world, no matter what happens in politics or, or with persecution or tribulation or anything else, I'm going to be with Him and there is reason to celebrate. We are born... Again, Amen. not only were we chosen by God, but we were saved by God. It's more than just the Father's electing love. As we look down this blessed, uh, verse 3 again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We were not just chosen by God, but we were saved by God through Jesus Christ. It's more than just His electing love. I mentioned it already, but I'm going to say it again. He had to have the Holy Spirit that came and knocked at the door of our heart and said, Hey, you need to be saved. You are lost on your way to hell. Hey, you're hopeless and helpless on your own, but I'm here and I've sent my son and I love you. And we answer or we don't. And if you bid him in, he will come in and he will forgive you of your sins. It's the convicting work of the Spirit, but also the sacrificing work of Christ on the cross. Talk about, there, the, re talk about the lively hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Before he was resurrection, re resurrected, he had to die. And oh, the fact that our loving God sent his only son, God himself, to the earth to live as a man, to live and to suffer and to struggle here on this earth and then to pay a price that we could not pay because he loved us because he was willing and he sacrificed on the cross we can look at it this way again it takes uh, it, it takes all three the father the son and the spirit to be saved the, we have been chosen by the father we've been chased by the son and we've been set apart by the spirit we've been saved by God. I want you to see a Christian's hope described. I want you to look down there in verse 4, and I want you to see the living hope. First of all, verse 3, it's a lively hope. It's an active hope. It's a living hope because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. 
Jesus Christ died. He didn't go and just hang out in a grave. He didn't go in just some kind of coma or whatever, and then he woke up. He was dead, and he was raised back to life again, proving the accepting of God's, uh, the, accept, the accepting of, of, by God, of his payment for our sins, for the whole world, for all who would believe. And so therefore, he was raised back up in life. And we have a living hope that is grounded in the Word of God. But also it's because of the living Son of God who today lives and reigns and is at the right hand of the Father. It's because our hope has life. Your hope didn't end when you got saved. It didn't just stay and stagnate and stale. Your hope that you have as a Christian is living, breathing, and growing. And you are to be living, breathing, and growing. Expanding. Listen, you are to, to become greater and more beautiful in Christ because you are growing in Christ. You say, well, how can we become more? I didn't say he loved you anymore or any less. I'm saying as he makes you more like him, you become more beautiful. You become more perfect. And one day he will make you perfect. Oh, it's a living hope. Not only that, but I want you to see the Christian hope is because of our inheritance. Verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. We are included in Christ's last will and testament. Did you know that? Christ had a last will and testament. If you would, turn over to the book of John. John chapter 17. Gospel of John chapter 17. This is Christ's last will and testament. His prayer before he went to the cross. And in verses 22 to 24, he says this, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. There's reason to glory. Listen, there's reason to glory because he's given it to us. He's given us the reason to glory because he's given us his glory. Verse 22 and 23, I've given them and they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me that thou may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and thou hast loved me. Father, I will they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my, there's that word again, glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. His last will and testament was for us to glory and to have glory and to glorify him. Listen, it's an inheritance that we have. We share his possessions. In a world where people are striving to have something, people are dying in the workplace, meaning they are working themselves to death so that when they can die, they can have something to pass along. I've always thought it would be better to live And to teach others to live. But my point is this. He's got it all. He owns it all. That old song of cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. Every last bit of it. And we are sharing in his possession. All the power, all the money, all the resources, everything, the whole world, the whole universe is his. There's reason to celebrate. There's reason to glory. We share in his family. We are his family. The adopted children of the king, the joint heirs of Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, there's reason to glory. Because we were born to glory. And it's uh, this inheritance. You know, people work towards, you know, leaving something that their children can inherit. It's amazing to me how people can stress themselves to death. 
They have money invested in a business or they have money invested in the stock market or they have money, whatever it is. And then something like COVID comes along and can wipe it all out or something like the government can come along and change all the rules or whatever it is. And people worry, what am I going to leave for my children? Leave a testimony of faith for your children. Listen, it will never fade away. It will never be corruptible. It will never disappear if you leave that kind of inheritance. We share in his glory, and it is an, uh, unlike any an earthly inheritance, incorruptible. What does that mean? Nothing can ruin it. Nothing can ruin it. Things can ruin the stock market. Things can ruin your business. Things can ruin your bank account. Things can ruin your home, your land, your cars, your whatever it is that you're hoping to leave as an inheritance. Your legacy, unless your legacy is one of faith, it's incorruptible. Nothing can ruin it. It's, what's the next word that it says there? He said, I mean, let me get back to my passage. Go back to, go back to Peter. Lost my place. Undefiled. I knew what I, what I typed in my notes was wrong. I said undefined. I said, well, that can't be right. Undefiled. Undefiled. He says it's incorruptible, but undefiled. So what does undefiled mean? It cannot be stained. It cannot be cheapened. It cannot lose value. Not only can it not be lost or not be ruined, but it can't lose its value. Name one thing in this world that does not lose its value. Name one thing. You say, well, gold. Gold still goes up and down. Your home still goes up and down. Your property still goes up and down. Your car does nothing but go down. Nothing in this world. It's unlike anything in this world. It's reason for glory and reason to celebrate because this inheritance is different than anything else we've ever seen in the world. It's undefiled. It will never grow old. It will never wear out. It will never disappoint us in any way. Oh, listen, this inheritance that we call salvation has been given full and free because of Christ on the cross and the mercy and grace and love of God our Father and all oh, what an inheritance it is. And there is reason to glory. It's called salvation. You know, when we were, in reality, and I've told you this, and I'm sure you've heard this from other preachers, but I'm going to close it this way, reason to celebrate, because it's going to lead me into my next point. We were really saved in three senses, or three tenses. We were saved in the past, when Christ died on the cross. You, I guess you could go back and say when Christ elected us, when Christ chose us. But when Christ died on the cross, that sealed. And even when I say that, I guess I could go back and say, well, anything that God's going to do, it's going to be done. But with Christ on the cross, that sealed. For all to know, all can be made aware of the fact that we can be saved, or you, if you are saved, you were saved because Christ died on the cross. But also you are saved because when the Holy Spirit convicted you and you realize your need of salvation, not when you first went to church, not when you went to church for the seventh time or the hundredth time or the seven thousandth time, but when Christ convicted, when the Holy Spirit convicted you of your need of salvation and you answered the affirmative and you repented and you believed by faith, you were saved. But also you're going to be saved. And that is when God comes again. And that's what he's talking about down here. The glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ is when we will be saved because it will be made complete. Not that it's already not decided, but it will be fulfilled, completed when he comes and makes it, takes us home to be with him. And we're given a new body in a new city and a new society. That heavenly city. Oh, listen, we, what a glory that we have. What a glory we ought to offer. Oh, how we ought to glorify God. How we ought to glorify Christ and realize that the glory that is His is also ours and it's reason to celebrate. It's reason to glory. Won't you glory in Him? Won't you celebrate 
what God has done and is doing. And won't you get your mind off the news, off the TV stations, off the radio stations, off the newspaper, off the social media, off the politics, off all the things that are going around. You said, preacher, you saying we ought not to be educated. That's not what I said. I said, don't focus on those things. Everything that you encounter, you've got a baseline of Christ. And when I say baseline, we think of being low, and it's a foundation. But that baseline's up here. You can only, in sports, I'm going to close this way. In sports, they talk about what's a player's ceiling. We're coming up on the NFL draft. Here in a few weeks away, uh, in April, we'll have the NFL draft. Well, they'll draft the best and the brightest prospects from college into the NFL and as they do, you'll hear, and as, as many of us that enjoy sports, we read about the profiles and we read about the projections of what they're going to be like and what their strengths and what their weaknesses are. And you'll get a lot of arguments about people who they have a ceiling up here, but also their basement or their, that could be a bust and a boomer bust prospect. Our hope is not that. Our baseline is sky high. Listen, there is nothing that compares to the glory we have in God. We ought to celebrate. Don't let the world drag you down. Don't let the devil discourage and depress you. Don't let the news and the politics t twist and contort your mind and your attitude. Look to Christ. Look to the Father. Celebrate all that we have. And you say, well, preacher, I've never been saved. I've never had that kind of hope. I've never, then listen, you can glory because you can. You can call on him. Oh, won't you call on him today? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would be with us. And oh God, that you would touch us. And oh God, that you would speak to us. And oh God, that you would encourage us. Father, we need you. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you will do. But God, we need to know the glory of God and that we can celebrate Help us to grow. Help us to know. Help us to glory. Thank you for the letter of Peter. Thank you for these verses of reminder. Father, fill us and overwhelm us. Drive out the angst and the bitterness and the hurt and the sorrow that the world wants to fill us with that leaves nothing but emptiness and shallow. But God, fill us with your depth, with your love, with your knowledge, with your grace, with your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Lucas, if you'd hit stop on that live stream. If you are here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I, this is the home crowd. I understand that if you don't know Christ and you're here today, won't you come? It's not too late. It's a good day to trust in Jesus Christ. If you're watching today, I, I, you're off now, but I, I, anybody, listen, tell people. What a wonderful time to come to Christ. But maybe you're here and you become overwhelmed by the pressures of this world, by the negativity of this world. Maybe you're mired in sorrow and pain and hurt and suffering and loneliness, whatever it might be. Maybe you're going through a personal trial. Maybe you're going through a sickness or somebody in your family is. Whatever it is, a death, disease, whatever it might be. I'm telling you, get your eyes on the reason for glory. And that is Jesus Christ. That is our Father, God in heaven. Won't you come and just ask him to help you today?